Good morning. Welcome everybody this morning. It's a little mild, so we'll just all get through it together. We have quite a few announcements. I just wanted to highlight, it wasn't in the bulletin, but there's a leaflet back there about the family nights that are gonna start. And the first one will be October the 9th and they'll run through till April. So if you have any questions or interested in coming out, uh, lots of people know about it. You could talk to Darrow. Um, I think it'll be a good, good little night. So Denny has an announcement. Actually, I have two announcements. The first announcement is audience participation. I'd like you to tell me something that weighs anywhere between uh, three ounces and maybe 200 pounds. Barry. <laughs> well, it's not Barry, it's not you. However, if you come to the service next week, you will find out. Because of the blessing of the pets, we have them as light as two, three ounces and we have them a few hundred pounds over. And they're all going to be here. However, because we have a problem erecting the stable uh, uh, in front of everybody at the moment, we're going to find a, a better way, or another way, not, it's never a better way. Uh, we're going to uh, show slides of the pets that are being blessed. I'm not sure, I haven't talked to Daryl about if there's any particular order and they're gonna go up in random order. We'll talk about, get that ironed out this week. Uh, but if you want to have a pet uh, blessed or a picture of your pet up there, whether the pet is still living or has since has passed away, send me the, a copy of the picture or send it to Lorraine. She'll send it to me. It'll be on the screen at some point during the service next week. Uh, but we have a nice variety already, but we, could, we can have as many as you want to send in. And I know that they do range right now between about three ounces to over 100 pounds. So uh, keep them coming, and you have until this middle of the week. I don't want to get them on Sat Sunday morning. Oh, can you do this? Okay, that was the one announcement. The, se <laughs> the second announcement is, it, it's not in the bulletin, I don't think, anyway, I haven't read it yet, uh, is that uh, in next nine days from now, on, a, on the next Tuesday, the first Tuesday of the month, we're going to the Gleaners again, and that's the Gleaners in Leamington. Uh, this is a chance where we can go out into the community and work on behalf of all of, of what the Gleaners does, and that is to cut up all sorts of vegetables that have been donated by people who can't sell them, and rather than send them to the food banks, they, pardon me, into, not to the food banks, but to the landfills, they send them to the Gleaners for dicing and slicing, and we make uh, uh, dehydrated food, and then they, uh, chips. Is that what they call them, food chips? Sure. Okay, food chips, and anyway, but they need your help. We need, like to have about 30 people out, and uh, we usually bring a group along of around eight to 10, and we'd love to have you. And if you would like to come and join us, we do provide transportation from the church parking lot at eight o'clock in the morning, uh, and if you wanna drive your own, that's fine too. Uh, but uh, that will be on Tuesday, the first Tuesday of October. Thank you. Just a quick announcement. In my hand, I have one of the lap blankets that is made by uh, the people who make lap blankets for the Love Nam project. It won't fall over. What I have is a couple boxes downstairs in the wool room, which is down the hallway, down these stairs, there's a Sunday school room, and then there's a room full of wool, and then there's the hall. So in this room, there are a couple boxes that have Love Nam blankets on them. And if you know of somebody who is in hospital, who is ill, who is in crisis, or just would like to have a warm hug from the congregation, anybody can go in there and grab a blanket, and there's some bags down there if you need one. And on it is a little tag that's written up that says, um, from the Love Nam program at Harry United Church, attached if you'd like to put it on there as well. So uh, if you don't know where that is, you can see me or Lorene or and ask around, but they are down there, a couple big boxes, uh, and you're welcome to help yourself. Thank you. Uh, I had announced earlier in the year that we're looking at uh, replacing the roof on the east side of the church. Uh, we've had some uh, people go through and pick out some colors because we're so the discussion is try and match the 
sanctuary roof or something else. We've narrowed it down to three. If you want your say on what color we pick, I'll be in the parking lot on your way out from church today and you can have a look. I noticed this screen up here that said, the storm before the calm. I'd like to say this morning, this is the calm before the storm. So, starting with turkey dinner announcements. Tomorrow morning at nine o'clock, thanks to Kathy and Bruce, who cooked it all yesterday, it is ready to be scooped tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. So if you could help scoop, sit down job, please, please come in. Also on Thursday, we're kind of at the mercy of our providers here who provide us with the best prices and things for our food. So on Thursday, the turkeys are ready, which means that they have to be picked up at the supplier and brought to the church, put on carts, and taken downstairs to the freezer. And we have the two gentlemen, I hope, Bruce and Roy, who did pick them up last year, and they'll be delivering them to the church. And so we need people, just three or four people, to help take 60 birds downstairs to the freezer. They're on carts, so if you can help, strong arms, we would really appreciate that. We're getting these at an excellent price, lower than last year, so uh, we will take them when we can get them. Friday morning, and the bread is coming in. Again, the cost of the bread is the same as last year, so we have 185 loaves coming in, and Kathy is going to pick that up. And we would like to get it cut up right away because we can't leave it in those plastic bags because it will start to mold, particularly in this weather. So if you could come in, I know Friday is not a great day for everybody, but if possible at all, we can have it done in an hour and a half at 10.30 because the bread arrives earlier. So 10.30, if you could cut it up, it's an easy, easy job. It's a fun job. And please, if you can help, at 10.30 on Friday, that would be great. And thank you for all your help this week with the squash and everything that went on. Thank you. If there are no other announcements, let us prepare for worship. I think that some Sunday, I'm not going to prepare anything for worship, and we're just going to sit and listen to Larry play. Because he, he has such a beautiful touch, and it's just such a nice introduction to, to worship. So I'm glad you clapped. That was good. Thank you, Larry. Yeah, it's always a pleasure. There's a few more people here than last week. This is the part of the service where we, where we center out the people who weren't here last week. <laughs> if you're glad to be back, put your hand up. That's most of us. That's great. If you want to take a minute now and say good morning to someone, try to pick out someone you haven't talked to yet. Go do that. We'll ring the bell and bring you back. Today I'm handsome. <laughs> Well, that was good. Well done. 
I think it changes the feeling in the room after you've done that. Because we're not just a bunch of people sitting in a room. We are more like a community because we've connected a little bit. So thank you for, for, for doing that. And thank you for sitting down again. Good job. Our call to worship. This world we live in is a delicate, complex, and beautiful gift. We give thanks for all the gifts of God. We are grateful even for things beyond our understanding. We light this candle to remind us that God is with us. Actually, it should say we try to light this candle. All right. We humbly seek to follow the Jesus way. We have a little song after lighting the Christ candle. Verse 1 of Touch the Earth Lightly. I was thinking about Dennis's announcement about the blessing of the animal service. And uh, Dennis does a great job making announcements, but he totally confused me. Um, so, so it is okay to bring live animals, where we are bringing actual animals. If, if you don't want to bring your pet or you don't think that would work out, yeah, yeah, email him a photo of your pet, that would be good. Um, and, or, or if your pet has passed away, it would be much better to bring the photo. You like that, Linda? <laughs> Linda liked that. That's good. But don't be afraid to bring your, to bring your pet. And, and I absolutely trust your judgment. You'll know whether it's a good idea or not to bring your pet. And, and I'll be curious to see how many of them actually weigh 200 pounds. That'll be something to see. So to, as a way of preparing for worship, we'll have a, a, a time of silence that we begin and end with the ringing of the prayer bowl. And it's time for praise music. We'll let Larry get organized and he can start tinkling away.
there, a little brain worm happening, so that's good. And our second one this week is Michael Row the Boat Ashore. hearties. I said, ahoy there, me hearties. Ahoy. <laughs> well, you're supposed to be saying, aye, aye, captain. Now, we'll try this again. I want to hear you all say, aye, aye, captain. Now, ready? Ahoy there, me hearties. Arr, you all look like you've been washed up on the beach. And you look somewhat like a pirate. Arr, there be nothing like it. The deck slapping the wind beneath your feet and the waves in your hair. You mean the waves slapping the deck beneath your feet and the wind is in your hair. Arr, that's what I said, you barnacled blowfish. Oh, my, you really are. Pirate. Arr, I be worse than that. I be a pirate captain. Oh, really? A pirate captain? That Arr. must be terribly exciting. Arr, the salty breeze is in your eyes and your nose on the far horizon. Hmm. I think you really mean that the salty breeze is in your nose and your eyes are on the horizon. Will you stop interrupting me? If I wanted someone chattering at me all day, I'd get a marmoset from the Madagascar monkey market. I was just pointing out Arr, that... I did I just tell you to be quiet? Who's the captain here? I said, who's the captain here? Aye. You are captain. That's better. <laughs> Arr, that's right, the captain is the boss, the scourge of the seven seas, the master of the toughest crew that ever sailed a tub under canvas, lord of the entire ocean. Hang on a minute. I wonder if you're going a bit far there. Shiver me, Timbers, you again. What do you mean? I just thought that maybe you're overrating yourself. Arr, you're a cheeky little crab. Why, there be no better captain than me. Let me ask you this. Have you ever been in a storm? Arr, storms I've seen plenty. Hurricanes, typhoons, tidal waves. I've seen the winds in the Atlantic that would blow the sun off course. I've seen waves in the Pacific that would sink old England. I've seen it so stormy that the rain didn't fall down. It got sucked up out of the ocean, was blown up into the air. Wow, 
That sounds so scary. How did you survive? Well, the waves were so high, they were breaking over the top of the mast. The pumps were pumping more water out than in, and the sky was as dark as Blackbird's chin. The rain was bucketing down so hard you couldn't tell what was sea and what was sky and why... So wouldn't... why didn't you just stop the storm? Stop a storm? Nobody stops a storm. Even the most fearsome pirates turn ship and run for cover. There'd be not to do but batten the hatches and hold on and hope for the best. Nobody stops a storm. Well, that's not true. Our Bible story today tells us about the time Jesus went out in a boat with his disciples. It says that a furious squall came up, the wind started to howl, and the waves broke over the sides of the boat, causing it to violently sway to and fro, to and fro. <laughs> Meanwhile, Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, how can you sleep? Don't you care if we drown? He got up and said to the wind and the waves, Quiet, be still. And then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And the disciples were shocked and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Well, that be a good question. Who is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? Well, why is it a good question? Because nobody, let me tell you, Nobody stops a storm. Even if the wind dies down, it takes days for the waves to settle. Not even a captain can do that. So who do you think it is then? Who can order the wind about and the waves obey him? Well, the captain is the boss of the ship. And when the captain speaks, the whole crew obeys. But who is the boss of the ocean? The captain of the wind, the lord of the ocean, has to be the one who made it. So who must be the man <coughs> this man have been? Who must it have been? This man, Jesus, must have been God. Nobody else can order around God's creation like that. And just like that, he made the world. He made us. <clears throat> he made us so that means he will care for us and be cared for the disciples. And when we have troubles and the storms in our lives, God will calm our fears so that we needn't have worried or be afraid. It's like he's beside us right in this boat. Well, shiver me, Timbers. I think you're right. I'm the captain of my ship, but this man Jesus is God himself, and that makes him the captain of everybody including me and you. Amazing story. Well, I'm off to find me orders from the captain of creation. Happy sailing, me hearties. Bye-bye, captain. Aye-aye. So we're going to take up the offering now and collect the food. Are, are you guys going to help do that? Help bring everything up? Okay, you know what to do.
say the dedication prayer out loud together. Creating, loving God, you are the ultimate source of our lives. All that we have and all that we are comes from you. May the gifts we make today be signs of our gratitude and our intention to follow the way of Jesus. Amen. So if you're going to Sunday school, you could go do that. Psalm 29. Bravo, God, bravo. Gods and all angels shout, encore, in awe before the glory, in awe before God's visible power. Stand at attention. Dress your best to honor the Creator. God thunders across the waters, brilliant. God's voice and face streaming brightness. God across the floodwaters. God's thunder tympanic, God's thunder symphonic, God's thunder smashes cedars.
God topples the northern cedars. The mountain ranges skip like spring colts. The high ridges jump like wild kid goats. God's thunder spits fire. God thunders, the wilderness quakes. The creator makes the desert of Kadesh shake. God's thunder sets the oak trees dancing a wild dance, whirling, the pelting rain strips their branches. We fall to our knees, we call out, glory. Above the floodwaters is God's throne, from which God's power flows, from which God rules the world. God makes the people strong, God gives the people peace. Job chapter 28, verses 20 to 28. So where does wisdom come from? And where does insight live? It can't be found by looking, no matter how deep you dig, no matter how high you fly. If you search through the graveyard and question the dead, they say, we've only heard rumors of it. God alone knows the way to wisdom and knows the exact place to find it. The creator knows where everything is on earth and sees everything under heaven. After God commanded the winds to blow and measured out the waters, arranged for the rain, and set off explosions of thunder and lightning, God focused on wisdom, made sure it was all set and tested and ready. Then God addressed the human race. Here it is. Fear of the Lord, that's wisdom. And insight means shunning evil. And now we will sing hymn number 410 in Voices United, This Day God Gives Me.
Luke chapter 8, verses 22 to 25. One day, Jesus and his disciples got in a boat. Let's cross the lake, he said, and off they went. It was smooth sailing, and he fell asleep. A terrific storm came up suddenly on the lake. Water poured in, and they were about to capsize. They woke Jesus. Master, master, we're going to drown. Getting to his feet, he told the wind, silence, and the waves, quiet down. They did it. The lake became smooth as glass. Then he said to his disciples, why can't you trust me? They were in absolute awe, staggered and stammering. Who is this anyway? He calls out to the winds and sea, and they do what he tells them. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks for reading. I want to say thank you to John and the choir and our percussion section. That was pretty amazing. You brought thunder and lightning into the room. Well done. Did you already clap for them? You can clap for them again. There was this old guy named Steve who refused to leave refused to evacuate, even though forecasters said a huge storm was building, it was on the way, it was going to cause a nearby river to overflow its banks, would flood the neighborhood, and was going to wash away his house. He sat on his porch, reading his family Bible and praying that God would protect him. The sky grew dark with ominous clouds that opened up and poured down torrential rain. Though floodwaters rose, Steve was forced to take refuge on the roof of his house. A kindly neighbor paddled his canoe close and called out, Climb in, i got room for you. Steve responded, No, it's okay. God will save me. So the man in the canoe paddled on, looking to help other people. A motorboat roared up, and its gunnels knocked against the eaves of Steve's roof. The woman at the helm cut her motor and shouted, climb in, I can take you to safety. Stranded Steve said, no thanks, I'm praying to God. God is going to save me, I have faith. The woman in the motorboat read the look on his face, knew there was no arguing. She went on, seeking others to rescue. A military hel helicopter swooped down, scattering loose shingles and making ripples in the rising water around the top of Steve's house. By this time, he was right on the peak of the roof, one hand on the chimney for balance. A voice came over the loudspeaker. We need to get you out of here. We can lower a rope ladder, and a member of my crew will help you climb. We can lift you away from danger, and in moments, you'll be at a warm and dry shelter from his precarious perch. Steve waved the helicopter away and yelled, No thanks. God will save me. The helicopter, powered away, went on to rescue a family from the roof of an apartment building just two blocks away. Before long, the floodwaters rose above Steve's roof, rooftop and he was swept away. He perished in the cold, murky water. Steve went to heaven, but he was mad as hell. <laughs> he complained to the creator of the universe I put my faith in you, but you didn't save me. You let me drown. I don't get it. So the maker of mountaintops and butterflies, oceans and human hearts, looked with love, with fondness, with kindness at Steve and said, Steve, you are such a big goof. I sent you those caring folks with the canoe and the motorboat and the helicopter they placed themselves at great risk to help you, and you blew them all off. Have you heard that story before? Yeah. It's one of those stories that is probably not true, but it should be. Because it, it carries truth. It's a parable. Mature faith 
is not about looking to God to solve all of our problems. Every one of us, each of us is already being created with hearts and minds, with muscle and creativity, with spirit and curiosity, with compassion and with the capacity to learn and grow. You know, we can make a lot of trouble for ourselves, and we do. We make trouble for others. That happens. But we can also do a great deal to help each other. We can actually work together to get each other out of jams. We can make a difference. Each of us have what philosophers call human agency. Agency is the capacity to act, to do something. Each of us can make choices for good or for bad. Each of us are responsible for our actions. And to some degree, we are also responsible for what happens when we fail to act. Old Steve on the roof accepted a diminished view of his own agency when he chose just to sit there and do nothing and wait to be saved. And he also rejected the agency of those who were coming to help him. Something about Steve, something up here or in here, he was not able to accept that those kind folks who were coming to help him could be part of God's plan, God's partnership with all humans. I would also say that Steve had a really limited understanding of the nature of God. He was acting as if God was on call to do his bidding. He prayed, save me, God, and then just sat there and waited for God to come running like a well-trained puppy or a domestic servant. God, I need something. He imagined a tame God who conformed to what he needed God to be. A cosmic parent who would swoop in and protect him from his own foolishness for not evacuating when the flood warnings came. I would say that many of us who are parents have had the experience of cleaning up after a child who's made a big mess. Anybody here know about that? Whether they're six months old or six years old or 26 years old, there are times when you just roll up your sleeves and help pick up the pieces and try so hard not to say, I told you so. A wise parent will do more than that. A wise parent doesn't just pick up the pieces, make it easy for the kid. A wise parent also encourages their child to mature to grow into a sense of their own agency, to make the connections between their choices and the consequences. A wise parent raises their child to help others and to help themselves. So a mature view of God and our relationship with God includes the awareness that we are actually responsible for picking up after ourselves and we have a duty to help each other. A mature view of God also includes the recognition that we can't domesticate God. God doesn't actually work for us. We work for God. God is the senior partner in the human divine relationship. When we're witness to a big storm, whether it's a thunderous rainstorm coming in off the Great Lakes, or whether it's the tropical storms and hurricanes that we've been seeing on the news, we might experience the stark and powerful reminder that you and me, we are not actually in charge. We don't run the show. A lot happens in this world that can be frightening, overwhelming, in which... If it was up to us, we wouldn't choose. So part of the uh, wisdom we can gain from a storm is humility. A reminder of our place in the natural order. 
We can't boss nature around. Captain said that, right? Aye, aye. Doesn't actually work to give orders to God. And that's probably a good thing because we don't actually know what's supposed to happen. What's the best thing to happen? So if we could give God orders and God would come running and do our bidding, would that necessarily be a good thing? We don't know how things are supposed to be. But there's a view of the natural world and of the vastness of creation that has prevailed, I think, for far too long. It places us, places humans at the center and at the top of everything. Humans have acted as if we can do whatever we want. It doesn't matter what we do. Somehow the world will fix itself. So we dump our waste into rivers and lakes. We pile our noxious garbage into landfills, thinking that if we cover it up, it's gone away. We've stripped the land of its topsoil, brought down forests and carved into the side of mountains, mostly in the name of profit. We have actively ignored the warnings of our brightest and best minds who've been saying for decades that we're doing great harm to this planet that's not ours. This planet that we share with all other living creatures And to be honest, we make decisions based on convenience and economics rather than on common sense or the common good. Probably maybe saw this on the news. This past Friday, millions of people, the majority of whom are much younger than the majority of us in this room right now, took part in a worldwide climate strike. This is all part of an historic global movement that started with a woman from Sweden named Greta Thunberg. I hope I'm saying her name sort of right. Greta was 15 when she got on this. On August 20th of last year, 2018, after terrible heat waves and wildfires had hit her home country of Sweden, Greta, by herself, one young woman decided not to go back to school until the 2018 general election in Sweden on September 9th. So from August 20th to September 9th, she sat or stood with a sign outside the Swedish parliament every day during school hours, and the sign said, School Strike for the Climate. And she, this one young woman, in grade nine at the time, demanded that the Swedish government reduce their carbon emissions as they had committed to in the Paris Agreement. Then on September 7th, just before the general elections, she announced she would keep on striking every Friday until Sweden caught up with what they said they were going to do and aligned with the Paris Agreement. She coined the slogan, Fridays for a Future, which has gained worldwide attention. She inspired school students across the globe to take part in similar student strikes. And there was one, a world strike this past Friday. There's another one that's going to happen here in Canada this Friday. So we probably know this too, that she, she traveled to New York, took her two weeks by sailboat to continue calling attention to the work needed to address the climate crisis. So tomorrow, she's speaking at the UN on the Climate Crisis Summit. On Friday, she'll be in Montreal to take part in a huge climate march, and then she'll be welcomed to City Hall to receive a key to the city. She's attracted a lot of attention, both positive and negative. Those who oppose her And what she has to say have often made it personal. The worst of them will deny Greta's human agency. They pick on the fact that she's young, that she's female, that she has a diagnosis of Asperger's, 
as if any of those things could possibly diminish the stark truths that she points to. That humans are making a mess of the planet. She's not wrong. There are others who either reject the science that Greta points to, or she says, oh, they say, she's just naive in thinking we could do anything to make a difference. It's either not happening or it's too late. People will say, we're just too reliant on the forms of energy that are responsible for so much of the ecological damage. So they say, oh, there's nothing we can do. So let's just carry on the way we are. Can you think of any problem that humans have ever faced that gets better if our starting place is, oh, it's too hard? There's nothing we can do. It's too late. Any problem in your own life that that's been a good starting place? Any problem in the life of one of your kids or grandkids? And they would say, it's too hard. I can't even do it. And you just said, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Forget it. Give up. There are people, lots of them, who would be very happy if Greta and the millions of other young people, if they just gave up, just went along with the way things have been going, whether the way things are, are going is good or not, they would rather Greta just shut up, stop raising such a ruckus, but I think Greta's doing the planet and all living things a very important and needed service. What she's doing is reminding us of our own human agency, the capacity to do, to think, to create, to imagine, to make a difference, to at least try, to do our very best to clean up after ourselves and help each other. Amen. Our hymn is 675, Will Your Anchor Hold?
Let's open our hearts for prayer. God of storms and of rainbows, of the grays of winter and the bright warmth of summer, you're with us through it all. Through Jesus, you showed us that you are there even when the waves are turbulent and the forecast is grim. You are the source of peace in the midst of chaos, of courage when the odds seem against us, and of charity and compassion when looking out only for ourselves might seem the most logical plan. Help us to help each other and work together to face the challenges of our time. Help us to take seriously the warning calls but how we treat the planet that is our home. Let us not give in to despair or cynical short-term self-interest. Help us remember that no good has ever come of quitting before we start. Give each of us the hope, the courage, the goodwill to make choices that are not just about ourselves, but take into the account the needs, the needs of others. Help us to be good neighbors in this huge global community. We're all connected in a web of interdependence and vulnerability. Give strength and determination to those young people who are emerging as new leaders in our world. Guide them as they challenge us, goad us, push us outside of our comfort zones to do what is right. We pray for those who have already lost hope or who have given in to greed, to pride, to the obsession with getting ahead no matter what. In this election season, give us the wisdom to discern carefully how to use our vote. Help us to ask questions and listen carefully to the answers. We pray that civility and common sense and respect can take the place of fake news, name-calling, and personal attacks. Loving God, we know that people face many kinds of storms and many kinds of vulnerability and need. We pray for those who are lonely, those who struggle with depression, those who are ill, those who care for loved ones who are sick. We pray for all those in hospital or under medical care. We pray for those who do not have access to the care and resources they need. We remember in prayer all those who are living with grief and those who are beginning to imagine a new chapter of life after the death of loved ones. We pray for those who are unemployed or underemployed or poorly paid for their work. We pray for those caught in a cycle of just barely getting by. We pray for those who work too hard and for those who feel frustrated by lack of opportunity. With all these weighty concerns on our minds and in our hearts, we also remember to give thanks for simple beauties and joys, for family and close friends, for monarch butterflies and migrating birds flying over for the satisfaction of a successful harvest, for the sweetness of a ripe peach, the tang of a good apple. We're grateful for our homes and who we live with and the opportunities we have for recreation, creativity, friendship, service to others. We give thanks for this church and other communities of faith. Help us to pay attention so we can discern the most helpful ways to bring your ministry to life right where we live. God, in many ways, we are like those disciples in a boat out in deep water in the storm. We may not always remember that you're with us. Even when the waves get high and we're scared. But you're always there nonetheless. For that we give thanks, even as we make the prayer out loud that Jesus taught. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. Our hymn is number 716, My Life Flows On.
For many we know and many we do not know, life is difficult. May we remember the example and teachings of Jesus. May we humbly follow in his ways. We leave here as beloved and blessed children of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you.